bit. I'm like, uh, as you know, first year MA at Queen's University, um, doing a research on fashion and Chinese diaspora. And I searched for like some garments from your aunt Lillian Wan from like both Museum of Vancouver and then the Vancouver Archives. So yeah. would you mind to like introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Uh, my name is Paul Yi. Um, I'm born in uh, Saskatchewan, but I grew up in Vancouver. Uh, Lillian Wong is my aunt. Um, she raised me from the time that when I was about three to four years old. I arrived in her home in about 1960. And so she raised me and I was with her until she passed away in 1986. So um, my aunt Lillian uh, played a pivotal part in my life. <laughs> Uh, she was born in Vancouver in 1895, um, and she lived through all the, the horrible years of racism mm -hmm. in Vancouver. Um, by the time I arrived in her home, uh, race relations were much better, but mm -hmm. she was very conscious of being Chinese. So um, she spoke fluent English, she spoke fluent Chinese, she could also read Chinese. Did you spend like most of your like childhood and teenage years with uh, Aunt Lillian? Yes, I did. We, we moved several times. Um, by the time she passed away, I was working at the archives. So I spent my elementary school, high school, university years, and even post-university um, years with her. So I took care of her at the end of her life. Um, do you know like a bit about the family's immigration history with um, Aunt Lillian's parents? Um, Aunt Lillian's father came first from China. Um, he was surnamed Ho, and mm -hmm. he first went to San Francisco and because of the gold rush, and then he worked his way slowly north to British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And I think he ended up um, in Kamloops, where he ran a, a sewing factory because mm -hmm. Kamloops had a Hudson's Bay company there. And I think there was trade there uh, with the native, with the First Nations people. And so there was a need for garments to be, to be made, produced locally. So I think that's where um, uh, Lillian's father started. Mm -hmm. um, he then sent uh, for Lillian's mother from from China, um, and she came from she came from the Canton area. Um, I don't know very much about how they met. I think she came over at a fairly young age when she was about maybe fifteen, and joined him here. Uh, joined him in. Uh, I think by that time they were on the west coast. The part of my aunt Lillian's story that I know best is when they were already in Vancouver. Oh. So her father. A man named Ho Jin Cheng ran um, a merchant tailor uh, store. So he mm -hmm. had sewing machines. He hired seamsters um, to produce clothing um, mm -hmm. that, were, that was sold beyond Chinatown. Um, so he raised his family there. So um, there was an older brother, Samuel. Lillian was the second oldest. And then there were three younger sisters, Lillian, mm -hmm. Winifred, and uh, Nellie. The youngest okay. sister, Ruth, died. Um, she was a nurse and she passed away. Mm -hmm. I don't know very much about her. Lillian grew up in, in uh, Vancouver's Chinatown, went to school. But um, I think when she was 13, her father went to China on a business trip oh. and died. So leaving Lillian's mother with these children in Vancouver to raise. And, so, and she did. One of the stories that she often told was that after her father died in China, um, her father's younger brother, who was in Vancouver, said to the wife, you should just sell the girls. They're used what? Yeah, so that comment was made and the mother, of course, refused because of course you could, those girls could have been sold easily as maids to the, to the richer families of Chinatown because it was cheaper than bringing in because of the head tax. Um, so the mother did not uh, do that. She defended and said, you know, we're daughters and we're not selling. So Lillian left school after grade three and went to work as a house girl in a white family. So very young, she was out working. Um, but her brother, Samuel, attended university. He oh. became an engineer. Uh, Lillian works um, uh, in Vancouver 
and then it gets a bit hazy. She is married off um, at about age 19. Her mother arranges a marriage for her mm -hmm. to marry a fellow um, in Seattle. His name is Henry, I can't remember, Henry Hing, that's right, Henry mm -hmm. Hing. And he was a well-placed Chinese American because he was a translator for the immigration service. So Lillian oh. spent time in Seattle, had a daughter there who died, or Lillian may have brought the, the daughter back because Lillian and Henry's marriage did not survive. Oh, okay. Lillian says he was fooling around on her and she came back to Vancouver. So that was the end of her first marriage. And at about this time, you will probably see pictures of Lillian working in a millinery store. Yes. She was with white ladies making hats. So that was one of her jobs. She worked in a millinery store. Would you say that um, Aunt Lillian have like kind of like a challenging upbringing? Oh, I, I believe it's absolutely with restraint, mm -hmm. uh, financially burdened. I know that, well, because what happens in the family is that both uh, Nellie and Winifred leave Vancouver. They get uh, married move to America. So Lillian is the one who winds up taking care of the mother who passes away in the 30s. So mm -hmm. Lillian, of course, I, has um, at least, to my knowledge, two other marriages in mm -hmm. Vancouver. She hooks up with other Chinese men. Mm -hmm. I know that um, she had children. She bore more children, but they didn't survive. Oh. Um, they didn't survive. And I remember being at the hospital with her and the doctor said, oh, what's the scar? And she said, oh, it's from an abortion, mm -hmm. which I never knew about. Um, so she had these um, um, relationships with other Chinese men. I don't know anything about them. Mm -hmm. She never talked about them. So she never talked about her private marriages. But the, what, the things that did pass on was that in the 1940s, she adopted a child, uh, uh, a child who was of mixed blood. He was half Chinese, half white, mm -hmm. an abandoned child that the church helped her adopt. And she raised this child with her, her, her husband, who was then my uncle. So in the 1930s, she hooks up with Fun, who is my uncle. And they, and they survive as a couple until he passes away in 1969-ish. Her social status actually went down, you know, for a woman who was Canadian born, her status went down because she wound up marrying or being with my uncle who was an immigrant. Mm. So she did not marry a fellow Canadian born or an American born whose status would have been higher. That is a very interesting point. So what, is there this hierarchy like level among like earlier immigrants that there's like kind of the hierarchy based on when you came here, if you were born here, and if you married to a white man? I, I believe so. The, if you look at the, the records of marriages for the first generation born in Canada of Vancouver, they tend to marry other in the other prominent families. Mm. But there, there wasn't a great deal of selection, right? So of course there's a mix and match. Um, but if you look at Lillian's first marriage, it was to an American born American. Mm -hmm. Uh, Winifred's husband was also um, an American-born. Um, so I think there was a hierarchy, social pressure that you you marry up if you can, or you, you want to stay in the upper classes, which is the English-speaking classes, the Canadian, um, the ones with businesses in Chinatown. Wow. And then you said when you like um, live with Aunt Lillian, she was already like in like around 60. She was at least 65 because I think she was just get, starting her pension. And what was like your earliest memories of her? Like because I saw like in the images, she were like very stylish with her sisters. What was like your earliest memory of like what she would wear? Well, she she had two sides to what she wore at home. Mm -hmm. She wore, I mean, for all of the, for, for, for herself and me and my brother, mm -hmm. uh, we always got dressed up nice to go outside. But as soon as we came home, we changed into, you know, some more ordinary clothes. Mm -hmm. So whenever my aunt went out, if she went to a banquet, she got really, really dressed up. Mm -hmm. Now, I should tell you one thing. 
my aunt was very proud of her looks. Wow. She was very proud of her looks. She said that when she was young, men praised her. And she used this phrase um, in Cantonese, it's which is something like, I, you know, eyebrows of a swan. Wow. Eyes of a phoenix. You know, it was that, that's how they described her beauty. Wow. So she was very aware of her, her good looks. Mm -hmm. And I think that affected her style. She mm -hmm. certainly um, uh, had a huge wardrobe. So what I remember about her was that every season, because we lived in a very, very small house, we mm -hmm. would do this seasonal change. She would bring out all her summer hats and all her summer dresses and her summer coats. And mm -hmm. she'd pack away all her winter hats, winter coats, and winter outfits in boxes and put them away. So this happened every year because mm -hmm. she had so much clothes. So she, you know, but she seemed to wear a few outfits over and over and over. Um, mm -hmm. They were dresses. They were always, she wore mostly Western clothing, mm -hmm. but she did have um, Cheng Sam. She had one that she was did. in black. She had it in black. Mm -hmm. I, and I think she only wore it when, um, I think she was buried in it. Um, her stepson arranged the funeral. So he uh, had the garment and that's what she was buried in. And I think she wore it at his wedding as well. Mm -hmm. She didn't seem to care much for wearing the Cheng Sam. She, whenever she went to Chinese banquets, weddings, whatever, mm -hmm. it was always Western, Western suits. Western suits. Western, uh, women's suits. Do you know where she mostly get her clothes? Would that be from the sisters or get it tailored or from like mass production? I think she would have been stylishly dressed because her sister, Winifred, worked for a department store, worked for oh. something called Marshall Field, which was a major department store in America and had to be very fashionable. And as well, Nellie, I think, married a diplomat, a Chinese diplomat. Oh, wow. She was also very fashionable. I think they, they were very aware that they were very attractive women and mm -hmm. dressed to it. And also they could afford it, at least in America, that those two sisters um, oh. were wealthier. And I know they sent Lillian clothing. Money? I know oh, clothes. They sent her clothing, nice items, like nice suits and whatever. I sh I'll, I'll tell you this, for all the years that I lived with her as a child, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think she ever went shopping for clothing. What? It seemed, that she, she, it seemed that she already had everything she needed. And the only time I remember her going out to buy a dress was when um, her husband, his son got married in Vancouver. So there's a big banquet and she was like the mother-in-law. So she went out and bought a, a really fancy dress at a really fancy store called Modiste. Modiste. Um, and I remember her chatting with a friend about it. You know, they, they, they talked about um, the dress a lot, but literally my aunt did not shop. She was very careful with the money in that household. Mm. Um, so she wore her, her nice clothes over and over and over. She had lots of shoes, but she took really good care of them. You know, she would always be, you know, coating them with white whatever to make sure that they could be good for another, another season. So she rarely went shopping for clothing by the time I got there. It's really interesting. Like you, she had a lot of clothes, but you never see her like shop, go shopping when shopping. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I think because there was a money problem, because I remember even nylons were sent over by her sister, because I remember seeing her opening, you know, these packages and mm -hmm. it's like nylons. Um, and we were poor. We lived in a very um, rundown house. Uh, we were never hungry, but I never got the sense there was a lot of um, extra, extra money. So by that time, her child raising um, style was very much um, strict, tough. Hmm? very strict, very, oh. tough. very tough love. And I think she was very hardened by her life, by um, her failures in marriage, her failures in raising children of her own. Um, so by the time my brother and I arrived at her home, she was very, very, she was overprotective of us. 
She okay. didn't let us. She didn't let us go outside to play. But if we went out, she made sure that we looked really neat and proper and well dressed. Do you remember at Lillian ever talk about um, her attitudes towards like being Canadian and with like her Chinese heritage? Was there ever conversations about kind of that hybridized identities? Well, she was extremely proud to be Chinese. She she knew she was Chinese. She she never pretended to be anything but Chinese. She was proud um, of her, her Chinese language abilities because she only learned to read um, from my uncle. She said my uncle taught her how to read the Chinese newspapers. So she learned that late in life and she wanted it and she managed it. Yes. And so she used to go to the um, Chinese opera. So by the 1960s, Hong Kong is sending out all these black and white um, Cantonese opera moves. And she went mm -hmm. every week and she dragged us along Right, because she wanted to see these movies. I guess she understood she could read the, uh, the captions in Chinese. Um, but she, her lesson to my brother and I was something like, you know, don't ever forget your Chinaman. You'll never, you'll never change. You can't change that. And, and that certainly affected why she insisted that we learn to speak Chinese. I would say she was pretty feisty about being, being Chinese. Uh, you know, it used to annoy her that in, later on in her years, um, her skin be became very light and people would often assume she was a white woman and she would get very angry about that. She, she certainly did cling to um, things that were Chinese. So during World War II in Vancouver, there was a, a Cantonese opera troupe that kind of got stuck in Vancouver. And somehow she became friends with some of these people, some of these Cantonese actors and actresses. And so this is during World War II. Mm -hmm. And some 20 years later, Aunt Lillian takes my brother and I to visit her sisters. We go to Chicago, we go to Washington, and we go to Toronto, because that's where her brother is. And while we're in Toronto, we look up these opera friends of hers who were in Vancouver during World War II. So mm -hmm. as an example of my aunt's very militant attitudes towards learning Chinese, she refused to take a TV into our house. Even oh. though her sister offered her one, she said, well, send you a TV. The, the boys should be watching TV. My aunt said, no. Why not? not? Gonna, they're not going to speak Chinese if they watch TV. We were thinking, oh, what a drag. We, we really wanted to watch TV. Do you, do you know if she has any, like, fashion icons she was talking about or, like, Hollywood stars or anyone she looked up to? Oh, no, I don't have any sense of Hollywood, she, that never came up. Her great hero seemed to have been Queen Victoria. Oh, because, wow, that's long before her. Because when I was a child, she would, she'd go to the, she would somehow get this book from the library, this biography of Queen Victoria, and she said, mm -hmm. I'm gonna read this. <laughs> she never did, right? Because I thought, wow, she's gonna read the book in English, mm -hmm. but she didn't. Um, but she, for some reason, this thing about Queen Victoria uh, stuck with her. And, and that's probably um, one of her female heroes. Another movie star that she seemed to follow was an actress called Lam Doi Lin Dai. Uh, I remember her name because she, <laughs> we had this, you know, in a door, you have a, a little opening that you can look out to see yeah. if anybody's out there. Well, our front door had that, and my aunt put this actress's <laughs> face there. Oh. So that when you came up to the door, you would see this actress's face looking at you. And it was this actress named Lam Doi or Lin Dai, uh, who was uh, big in, I think, the late 50s and early 60s in, in Mandarin speaking movies. A very, oh. very pr a beautiful actress, right? Very mm -hmm. attractive. But, you know, but I don't know um, what my aunt thought. Um, my aunt certainly, every year she would go to Chinatown and get these calendars from huh? all the stores, right? And all these calendars would have some sort of a scenic view of Hong Kong or, you know, the mm -hmm. Tiger Bomb Gardens or um, Aberdeen Beach or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then they'd always stick some actress on it, some current actress. So I don't know if that's why my aunt was so keen to get these calendars to look mm -hmm. at, 
what these actresses were wearing or doing. But she uh, she have those calendars, and I think she used to send them to her sisters. She made a point of sending them to her sisters <laughs> because I think she wanted them to follow the Chinese calendar because those oh, door calendars had you know the lunar dates, so they would know when New Year and uh, Moon Festival and all of those things would would appear. Question: What's like the media portrayal of like Chinese Canadian people? Um, during um, Aunt Lillian's time was like? Well, it would have been all very negative um, because in the late, in the 1950s and 1960s, there was a huge scandal in Chinatown mm -hmm. um, involved in illegal immigration. Oh. Huge, huge story. The RCMP raided um, and it was very real. I mean, the, the illegal immigration uh, was not fabricated. Um, mm -hmm. because at this time in the 50s and 60s, people were fleeing China, fleeing the communists, and people were desperate to come over. So a lot of people were using borrowed papers to come in and fit, mm -hmm. falsifying their names. And then the RCMP caught up to it and raided, and it, it made the headlines. So this would have been an extremely negative portrayal of uh, Chinese Canadians, mm -hmm. because everybody seemed to be involved. The selling of papers was so lucrative, mm -hmm. money could be made. Um, so that was very, very negative. I think also at that time, the coverage of China was also very negative because China's communist, mm -hmm. they're allied to Russia, is the big, uh, you know, in the 1960s, um, America was staunchly anti-communist. Mm -hmm. Russians were arming the Cubans. There was a threat yes. of nuclear war. So my aunt, you know, who read the news, knew about Khrushchev and Castro. And she said, oh, those rotten people, they're, they're just rotten. Can't trust the Russians. Mm -hmm. you know, she would go on and on about them. Um, so, uh, so for media portrayal, very little about Chinese people ever. And the only thing that I can think of would have been that immigration thing. So that's what she would have had to dealt with. But, but in, in a way, she was safe because it, was, it wasn't as if she had white friends because all of her friends were fellow Chinese, fellow Chinese Canadians or Chinese Canadian women. Oh. So she wasn't out there. She wasn't working with white people. She didn't have, we didn't have white neighbors. So it wasn't as if the media portrayal affected her. Okay. Because we were all protected by living in Chinatown. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, I also read about like kind of people couldn't like it's harder for them to like find jobs outside mm -hmm. that environment and to connect with people who are like of different heritage. So it's kind mm -hmm. of like how the communities formed and it's like really great to hear yeah. from you of like how families make those choices of like where they live. The only white friends that my Aunt Lillian had were the white missionaries at the churches. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, the Good Shepherd Anglican Church, when those were the missionary ladies who helped her adopt this child sure. in the 1930s. Um, so she always had very fond memories of these uh, white women uh, who were missionaries and who really tried to work with the Chinese community. She was mm -hmm. very fond of them. And because she spoke English, she, you know, she had access to them. So if we go back to the creative challenge would you um probably like imagine what your aunt would wear a gallery show like a kind of a fancy event in her younger years you what, have... year would be? what year um okay she was born in like 1895 so her coming of age would probably be like um around 1915 so late mm -hmm. 1910s so a western event. event or a chinese event um, a Western event or like in Canada or the community like Vancouver, Chinatown. Yeah. yeah. I think she would have been, she would have gone out and made a huge effort to buy whatever was really, really fashionable. Like she would have made sure she looked very good. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I draw that because that picture of the three sisters, um, which is from that period. Yes. They look fabulous, right? And they I, and did. I did. And I think it was very easy for them to, to do because I think they somehow had a fashion sense 
and they could sew like my aunt could sew she made she could make clothing and certainly my aunt was aware that looking good was important um going out um i remember when we were moving out of that house we we opened these trunks and there was there was all this glittery stuff like it was it was her old old clothing from probably her coming out years like flimsy dresses i remember them being beaded beaded they, they had little shiny things like not not sequins but little little pieces like clay things beaded into the fabric and they were long old fashioned dresses i think they were from the 20s so she had you know nice clothing and she knew to save them but i think you know she saved them you know for many many years and forgot about them and then then they weren't useful anymore thank you so much for like um sharing a lot about your aunt and your family with me and... good i i'm ho i hope you can use um uh, the stuff from her collection, from her photographs. I hope they help you somehow. I, you must be one of the first people. I don't know. I, I left them there when I moved to Toronto. So it's been like 30 years, over 30 years since I looked at that stuff. Did they show you the glass portrait of her? No, but they showed like portrait of Lillian at 16, which was probably the most interesting, one of the most interesting one. And it was like kind of like colored with like watercolor okay i think that's it's it's a portrait painted on glass and i think that's the age 16 and and i know that there it was touched up by color like yes the, yes that one okay so you've seen it great good that was that was her her claim to fame she was very proud of that And to find it how often I tried But my life is a race, just a wild goose chase And my dreams have all been denied Why have I always been a failure? What can the reason? Wonder if the world to blame. I wonder if it's good. 